Welcome to Perpetual Motion, an innovation and invention podcast. I am Colin Fowler. And I'm Michael Quinn. We're patent attorneys at Perkins Coie, and we're your hosts for this podcast. On this show, we discuss technology that intrigues and fascinates us, along with issues relating to inventors. While we are attorneys who endeavor to gain protection for our clients' inventions, we're here to connect with interesting people who have interesting ideas. On this episode, Michael and I are interviewing Danny Hillis, a serial inventor and renaissance man on his past and current endeavors. Danny currently operates a company, Applied Invention, where he contracts to engineer out-of-the-box solutions to confounding problems. Because we are lawyers, we do have to note that nothing stated here constitutes legal advice, and that the views expressed here are our own, and not the views of our firm, Perkins Coop. I recently watched the movie Jurassic Park. Actually, uh, we, we've been doing these movie sessions uh, with our friends where we've all been watching the movie together from different locations, kind of virtual get-togethers. And we decided to watch virtual Jurassic Park. And, and sure enough, there's a critical point in the movie where they're trying to get a computer to reboot the whole park. And the little girl, a teenage girl who's doing it all, she talks about using thinking machines and connection machines. And I thought of you. You want to... That's pretty cool. You want to comment on that? or Yeah, it's nice. They actually uh, kind of give us a plug in the movie. They brag about having two of our connection machines. But the connection machine was one of the very first parallel computers. Uh, it's what we would call cloud computing today or uh, parallel processing. And it was something that seems like an obvious idea of having a lot of computers working together on a problem. But for many years, people thought it was impossible to do because one of the big computer architects at IBM had kind of made a mathematical proof that made it seem impossible. What was this proof? <laughs> it was called Amdahl's Law. And for years, every time I would describe the computer that I built, people would say, well, haven't you ever heard of Amdahl's Law? And it was basically, he had kind of proven that the more processors you added, the less efficient it got. But the mistake he made was assuming the problem stayed the same. Mm -hmm. and the truth of the matter is the problem was growing bigger and bigger and bigger as you grew the number of processors too. So fortunately, I didn't believe Amdahl's law, <laughs> uh, although I couldn't really tell you what was wrong with it at the time, but I knew that I could make this this massively parallel computer work. And that was my first company. It was my PhD project out of the artificial intelligence lab at MIT, and uh, it was a it was a great way to get to get started in the world. Did Amdahl's law directly relate to series instructions, and didn't contemplate the concept of having you know a single instruction but multiple inputs? No, it did it did contemplate that, but it basically didn't contemplate the fact that the problems would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so sure enough, if you try to take a small problem and spread it out among too many processors, you run out of opportunities for parallelism after a while. But today, of course, we're no place close to running out of opportunities in parallel <laughs> parallelism because the problems are literally millions of times larger than they were in those days. I mean, in some sense, it was. it's good to have some intuition that's guiding you. And in my case, the intuition was the human brain, which I knew was made of very slow components, which were neurons. And I knew that the human brain was much faster at doing things like recognizing faces than a computer. So I knew Amdahl's law had to be wrong somehow, even if I couldn't put my finger on it at the time as to why it was wrong. Having worked at Thinking Machines, then, was the next stop for you at Disney? Is that how it worked, <laughs> or...? Yeah, actually, it's funny because it's funny you should mention that movie. That was kind of my first trip out to Hollywood and met Steven Spielberg, who was making that film. And I kind of got interested in what they were doing out there. And I actually visited Disney for the first time there. And I thought, wow, this would be a lot of fun. And when I went out to Disney at first as VP of Imagineering, at first I thought, it would just be a year or two as kind of a sabbatical vacation. But I ended up enjoying it quite a lot. And it stretched a different part of my mind. I got a different kind of education than I had gotten at MIT. And you got linked into that based on meeting with Spielberg? or No, actually, Spielberg was not at Disney. He was at one of the other studios at the time. But I think I got, I visited Disney first on that visit out to see the filming of Jurassic Park. And the 
Bass Brothers had just acquired Disney, and it was kind of an interesting time because it really was reinventing the way that it did feature animation. It was reinventing the way that it did the theme parks. And my kids at that time were four years old, so it was kind of perfect timing for me to do something that they related to. I remember that one of the one of the great moments for me was we built a park called Animal Kingdom when I was there, and I actually worked on the park from the very beginning right until it opened. And I went with my kids to the park, and in the middle of the park was a giant artificial tree that was just the most amazing thing you had ever seen. And one of my kids looked up at me and said, Daddy, did you make that or did God? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, it was a fun it was a fun job to have. It was a fun time to be a parent. It's interesting because when I would visit you down in, at your offices in Southern California, you always had the giant dinosaur, the tyr- tyrannosaurus that you had made. Did, that, did you make that when you were at Disney? I did. Yeah, that was actually one of the first big walking machines. It was a lot like. Uh, yeah, since Boston Dynamics has made much smaller, more agile versions, but it worked very much like that. It was a dynamic walking machine that was a dinosaur. And that was an interesting one because very often people come to you with what they think is the problem and you realize it's a different problem. So in that case, some of the park people came and said, can you speed up the rides in the park? And I said, well, why, do, why would you want to do that? And they said, well, because our number one complaint is that people are standing in line for too long. And I thought about that for about 10 seconds. And I thought, so if you speed up the ride, they'll stand in line. The line will move faster. They'll get a shorter ride, and then they'll get back in line. And they'll actually spend a larger percentage of their time waiting in line. So speeding up the ride is not a solution to that. So... If I had tried to solve the technical problem of speeding up the ride, it would have actually been a failure. So a lot of it was going back and figuring out, well, what's, what's really the problem? Why are people complaining about this now? And they didn't used to complain about it. And the answer was that when the parks first opened, I actually went back and found Walt Disney's original notes as to how the parks were supposed to work. And he didn't even mention rides, or, except for rides moving, that were actual transportation to get from one park or part of the park to another. So the park itself was exciting. And the rides were kind of added in later, but they were where people were spending most of the money. And so, of course, people want to stand in line and see where you're spending the money. So the, I think the answer was to put more of the money into the park, which indeed what they did. But by then it was very hard to get the park to compete with the rides. So that was so to kind of prove you could do that. I made a dinosaur that could wander around the park. And that made people not want to stand in line waiting for the rise and watch the dinosaur instead. So was this dinosaur um, a T-Rex it was, or was it a four-legged It was actually thing? a triceratops, a full-size triceratops. And I, actually, I kind of made a mistake on it because I made a gigantic triceratops. Everybody knew that I was working on a, tricerat- a, a giant robot dinosaur. And the Disney executives came to see the progress and if people are coming to expect to expecting to see a giant robot dinosaur it's hard to impress them because their expectations are very high so what i did is i i got a box that was only about 10 feet like a wooden crate that was about a 10 foot cube and i set them in front of it and talked to them about why they wanted a robot dinosaur and then i pulled a rope and the crate opened up and it was empty and then from behind the curtain came (laughs) <laughs> a gigantic dinosaur is the one that you've seen, Michael, which is much bigger than that, and came walking out from behind the curtain toward them. And I had wired up the sound so that every time it took a step, the speaker system went boom, boom, <laughs> and shook everything. And unfortunately, it sort of scared them to death. And they decided that what I had built was too scary. So the actual dinosaur that ended up going in the park was actually the size of the original crate and soft and fuzzy. So I don't think it was nearly as interesting as the one that I had built. Well, let's move on. You know, when I first met you, you you came up to my house, you and Stuart Brand came up and started telling me about the long now. And maybe you could speak a little bit about that. I thought it was a fascinating project to work on. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Yeah. So 
sometime in in the 1990s, I started realizing that the future was still in the year 2000. And when I was a kid growing up in the 60s, the future was in the year 2000. I remember watching 2001 Space Odyssey, and we thought about that. And it was sort of as if the future had been shrinking by one year per year for my entire life. And I realized that the the millennium was kind of a mental barrier for people, and they really weren't thinking about the long-term future. And the more I started thinking about that, the more I thought my life would be a lot better if if I really lived in a much bigger period of time that included centuries out into the future. And in discussing it with my friends, and particularly my friend Stuart Brand and Peter Schwartz and Brian Eno, we're talking about it, yeah, we really want to live in kind of a civilization scale time period. So, which is kind of a 10,000 year time period. So I started thinking about what could I build that would really make a difference 10,000 years from now. And so I started thinking about a mechanical clock because it's kind of a, a machine that people would have understood thousands of years ago. In some sense, people did build clocks like Stonehenge and things like that. And I realized that you could actually build a physical mechanical clock that could last for 10,000 years. And so I started working on that. And at first, it was just sort of a personal project. But then all my friends were like, this is a much too big a project. We need a foundation to do it. And so that was the beginning of the Long Now Foundation. And I built a version of the clock that actually struck two for the year 2000. But I really wanted to build one that would really last for 10,000 years, which involved building it inside a mountain because no building is going to last for 10,000 years. And so I started planning that and finding, searching around for various mountains. And Jeff Bezos came on one of these trips with me when I was looking, looking at a mountain and he offered to fund the construction of the clock. And so I've been working on that now for a few decades. And it's getting pretty close to being done. It's a, it's a huge, giant mechanical clock inside of a mountain. How do you power it for 10,000 years? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. That's, that's an example of something I kind of learned at Disney. If I, before my Disney experience, I would have powered it just by the temperature change from day to night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But one of the things I learned about at Disney is that what the hardest part of the a problem like this is making people care about it for 10,000 years. And people care more about things that care about them. So I decided it was important for people to somehow have to wind the clock. On the other hand, if the clock got lost for a few centuries, I wanted it to keep ticking. So the way that it works is it, it powers itself just from the temperature change from day to night. But it keeps itself wound, but it doesn't actually show you the time until you go and you physically wind it. And then Mm. when you wind it, it advances the dial forward until the current time, and then the bells ring. And it does require your winding to really move the dial forward. There was a lot that went into the clock. I remember working on the patents with you. And the (laughs) fact that it's actually a computer because the the Earth is going to be changing its uh, tilt over the period of 10,000 years, and so the days might be get longer or shorter. Maybe you could talk about that, too, how, how you had to think about it. Yeah, actually, that was one of the strangest patents ever, the improved astrolabe, <laughs> which, as I remember, actually literally quotes Chaucer's book on the astrolabe as prior art. But... <laughs> One of the things about the way that over 10,000 years, the Earth actually wobbles on its axis. Mm -hmm. And so where the sun is in the sky actually changes, not just by the time of day and the season, but, you know, what time it's at different parts of the sky changes because of the wobbling of the Earth. And so you actually have to compensate for that. So actually, it's it's one reason you should never never buy a used astrolabe that's more than about 2,000 years old and expect to have it. (laughs) <laughs> um, tell you the right time because this wobbling effect will have uh, made it be off. But I actually worked out a way of improving the astrolabe so that it had, in some sense, another degree of freedom to compensate for that. And that's built into the clock. So the clock knows about the Earth's wobble over 10,000 years. 
it knows about the, for instance, the possibility of tidal slowing because the polar ice caps melt, things like that all have to be taken into account. So some of these things that seem very abstract, like global warming, are not abstract at all over 10,000 years. I remember you improved the Congreve clock as well. <laughs> Actually, I, I would say that one was less successful. I had an idea of how to... The Congreve clock is one of those the ball-rolling clocks, for those of you who don't know it. And I found that you could, if you cut the shape of the ramp, it's less sensitive to time. But it's a pretty lousy clock design anyway. So an improved <laughs> one is still a pretty lousy clock. <laughs> yeah. What's actually keeping time in the uh, long now clock? So the long now clock is a classical pendulum, except it's a very, very slow pendulum. And that has an invention in it, too, because the materials that you could use are kind of limited that last for 10,000 years. So you, normally you would build a pendulum out of something called Invar, which doesn't expand and contract. But the Invar is actually not stable over 10,000 years. So it's built out of a combination of titanium and stainless steel, but it's actually a compound pendulum that has a, a weight above and below, which makes it go very slowly. But it's also chosen in such a way that it exactly thermally compensates. So it's a seven and a half second pendulum that's very insensitive to thermal change. How is it insensitive to thermal change, though? I mean, you're talking about metals, right? The... So the metals expand, but because they both expand up and down, and you use the differential coefficient of expansion of the stainless steel and the titanium to make the up expansion exactly compensate for the down expansion. And so you can actually choose the dimensions of the pendulum so that the, the expansions exactly compensate and uh, it doesn't, the time period doesn't change with changing temperature. So... Danny, you um, you and Brand Farron from Disney started a company that's gone on to become now Applied Inventions. Um, tell me a little bit about Applied Inventions. A, a lot of stuff has come out of, of your work there. We started the company to build things that people had never built before. And the original idea is that we would do it as for clients who needed something new. And generally something that required some new invention. So we've done everything from autonomous vehicles to new kinds of medical devices, different kinds of user interfaces. But generally, we like to be driven by a problem. So somebody comes to us and says, hey, we have a business to stop by this problem. Can you help us invent something? Many of the people that came to us were from government. So we eventually split it into the more government-oriented part, which is the part that Brand does now called Applied Minds and the more commercial part, which is what I do, called Applied Invention. So we've each got a team of people in machine shops and programmers and chemists and you name it. And we work on these problems. And I still do a lot of the ones where somebody comes to us with a problem. But we also sometimes solve a problem that we think people need solving and they haven't figured out yet. And those have actually been some of our most lucrative things. For example, we developed the, the knowledge representation te technology that Google currently uses in the Google Knowledge Graph. And so that was purchased by Google. So this is kind of how Google does searching and ad placement and things like that these days using this knowledge graph. That's the meta web? That's the meta web. That's right. So the idea there was to have a way of representing real world knowledge that was scalable and kept track of the source of where all the information came from. So now when you do a Google search, you actually kind of do two searches. You do one search, which is the old keyword search, which is how it originally worked. But you also do another search that searches the meaning of what you ask for into a graph of, of knowledge, a, a representation of the world's knowledge. So if you search for museums of New York, you might get something that advertises itself as an exhibit in Manhattan. It might not use the word museum or New York, but it knows the meaning of what you're looking for, and so it's able to find that. How do those connections work? How is that, at least in the background, what's tying that together? Well, 
it has a very large representation of the world's knowledge. I mean, literally hundreds of billions of relationships. So it knows that, you know, uh, Manhattan is in the city of New York and the city of New York is in the state of New York. And, you know, it knows about probably you as a person and it knows about the building that you're sitting in and it knows about the owner of the building that you're sitting in and the relationships between all of those things. So one of the things I remember about, if I, if I have this correct, is that it didn't require a schema to build this database. And yeah. Sort of talk about and, that a little bit. Well, and, and in fact, I'm still doing work in, in, in that area these days. But, you know, in, in a classical database, people would have to get together and decide how they wanted to represent something. So if it's a database about cars, they would say, okay, well, a car has a, a VIN number and it has a number of wheels on it and it has a weight and they decide what are the things they want to represent about it. And so there's a kind of schema and that's what a car is in the database. It has all of those fields. But that doesn't really work in general because somebody else comes along and they're interested in collecting cars and they're interested in who his previous owner was or, you know, whether it has a custom paint job on it or, you know, they want to know a different set of things about it. So data is pretty hard to repurpose when it's stored in a very fixed format like that. So in the meta web has a much more flexible way of representing relationships between entities where you don't have to decide beforehand what you're going to say about it. And I think that way is actually, I mean, that's what's let Google grow its knowledge graph up to the size that it has. I mean, the, the only bad news in that is it's a proprietary asset of Google. I mean, good news for Google, but bad news for the rest of the world um, because nobody else can take advantage of it. So I think that really a database like that ought to be, a database, certainly if it's a public knowledge like scientific knowledge, health knowledge, public information really ought to be a public good. And so one of the things I'm working on is sort of taking the next version of those ideas and trying to make them available as a public good through a, a group called the Knowledge Futures Group at MIT. And how would they host that? I mean, isn't it, if you have a, a large connection of this knowledge graph or a, whatever you want to call it, it's not trademarked by Google. You have, you have a, a large... Uh, by the way, I call well, it the underlay. It, the underlay, yeah, okay. It, I, it's because it's the sort of information that underlays all the publications that you see. For instance, scientific papers, the underlying information that's in the paper. Hmm. Or in, okay. in a news article, it's the underlying information that's in the news article. So, well, at first, um, MIT will do it, but eventually it's designed to be a kind of distributed representation in the same sense that the web is. So like the web, it's going to be hosted and, and mostly built by people for their own purposes. But, you know, like the web, it'll, it'll be a public resource. It'll also, you know, have versions of it that people won't share, like the web. But it'll really be a, a resource that's, that is, Unlike the web, it won't be a way of presenting the information. It will actually be a record of what the information is and who said it and where it came from. So it can be presented in a lot of different ways. Well, I was going to say, do you propose then a, um, a search technique for that for that information? It's something like a big data approach, or, or how would you use yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's lots of different search methods, but one of the things that's interesting about it is the way that it's represented, you don't really have to decide what's true when you put it in. So you and I might actually put in contradictory information and then somebody else, you know, might decide that, you know, you know more about what you're talking about, about that subject. And so it is really, it's a representation of who claims what is true and sort of, you know, why they claim that, what's the provenance of that information. And then kind of AI programs or, or even more conventional pattern matching programs can reason on that and, and make a presentation. I mean, something like that already happens when, for instance, Google draws a map for you about how to get home in the traffic. It's actually making up that presentation on the basis of a bunch of algorithms that are looking at its knowledge graph and sort of judging, you know, weighing the information and deciding what map to draw for you. So I think more and more of the information that you get is going to be produced in that way. It's going to be presented to you in a way that's kind of filtered and presented for your needs 
out of a database that has a much more complex set of information on it. So the underlay here is using basically a distributed database. It yep. is all over. And I still don't understand how you are viewing it. How, how so does... The way that you view it, I mean, it's, it's kind of like right now, the way that you view the knowledge graph, nobody ever actually goes and looks at the knowledge graph. What happens is that programs look at the knowledge graph and produce information for you to see. Mm -hmm. So a Google map is a great example. That's that you're really looking at information that came out of the Google knowledge graph when you see that. And it wouldn't be possible if there wasn't a representation of that information. Or actually pretty much any I mean a Google search page is like that. So what it does is more and more machines are producing presentations for us in a custom way for our needs. So when Amazon shows you a, a web page, that web page wasn't designed by anybody. It was actually built from Amazon's database, and they have their own equivalent of a knowledge graph, and they use it to build that page, and it has information about you and what you've bought in the past and and what other people have searched for, and it has data of what's available to sell, and it creates that presentation of the information just for you. But nobody else has ever seen that web page before. So the distinction you're drawing here is that there would be proprietary viewers or generators, but the baseline knowledge that it's drawing from, that is the public good. Yeah, and, and I think that people will very often mix public data with private data to make those presentations. So I don't think that people will give up on having their private data. You know, Amazon will always have its proprietary data of who bought what, and Google may have information about you that it doesn't want to share with its competitors and and so on. But there's a common base of knowledge like, you know, that Manhattan is in New York or, you know, what building is at this street address that it doesn't make sense for everybody to build their own database of that kind of stuff. It really ought to be a shared public resource. That's public knowledge. And so, for instance, scientific knowledge is, is in that category. I mean, when people make scientific publications, they want to get that knowledge out to the world. They don't want to take the, you know, the stuff that they're publishing is not things that they want to hold proprietary. They want other scientists to use it, to reference their papers, to build on it, and so on. And right now, there's not a great way of publishing that information in a way that machines can kind of find it and use it and put it together. So that's what the underlay is. So my, my killer app for the underlay, the thing that drives me, is when I go into a new field and want to understand it, I would love for it to draw me a map of that field that shows me my own ignorance on that map, the areas of my own ignorance on that map. So I'd like to see a map of my ignorance. <laughs> and then you know what you need to learn. Exactly. The, and the, the map of this ignorance is based on that you have submitted certain things to the underlay and that's what you know. And then anything that's not what you submitted is <laughs> therefore the ignorance. Yeah, so, so the underlay is in principle a map of the stuff that everybody knows that I could find out. I have a way of, of telling it, but let's say I've worked with it over time and it's learned the things that I do know. I mean, for instance, I could tie this to, you know, taking a college course. Really, the college course ought to tell me the things I learned from the course, and I can mark them in the underlay as I've, I learned those things. And so it can build a model, a model of me. That's, in some sense, the easier part. The harder part is being having model of what there is to be known. Once you've got that, I can go through and, you know, have an interactive thing that helps me paint the parts of it that I already know. And then discover the parts. Discover the parts you don't already know. Exactly. And so I think that that is kind of in the future how we'll navigate through knowledge. And so, I mean, I could take, for instance, you know, the U.S. Patent Database. That's public knowledge, but it's very hard to find something in it that doesn't fit neatly into one of the categories. With AI algorithms that are available right now, I could adjust that patent database and build a knowledge database that kind of knows everything that's disclosed in those patents. And then I could ask it questions. And, I mean, you could just imagine from the standpoint of 
inventorship and patenting, how great it would be to see the space of ideas that are kind of like that or, you know, what the things you've never heard of that solve that problem and so on. So one of the other things that came out of a if you work with applied inventions was I think called touch share was the touch screen technology. Uh, yeah, that was, that's my favorite invention ever because <laughs> that was the pinch to zoom pattern. And it was basically a pattern on the, on the gesture of, it was something that I always wanted to do like a map of my own ignorance, but I always wanted to be able to reach on a screen and just take my fingers and spread them apart and have the map expand out. And so we we built the first ones of that and and I think you actually wrote the patent on that for us Michael and which was issued and years later when Apple came out with the iPhone they tried to patent it and that patent got uh, actually disallowed because of that my patent is as prior art. So how did you come to think of it just you wanted to be able to Use your hand to, as a gesture to, to change to the, the presentation on the screen, and, and yeah, I wanted to do it, and you know, I built, I figured out ways of doing it, and there's all kinds of ways of sensing your fingers, but the critical thing was touch screens in those days. You could just you sensed one point, and the critical thing was to, you know, sense do multi touch to sense multiple points and sense two fingers spreading apart. And so, and, you know, we had things like rotations and so on, but the pinch to zoom was the kind of killer app of it. And and what I love now is, you know, I see four-year-olds try to do this to, they see a picture in a magazine and they try to zoom it out. <laughs> and uh, what I love about this is this is an invention that people in the future will never even believe anybody invented. They'll think babies were just born doing this, right? <laughs> It's funny, when, when technology is with you a long time, it's almost like it's intuitive now. It's no longer anything that you would think couldn't possibly exist. But I, I think about when you go back to when you were young and, and, and Star Trek or earlier and smartphone, and that was science fiction. And now we have in our pockets the computer power that we never could have dreamed of when we were children. Yeah, and actually, this is way better than those sort of dumb phones that Captain Kirk carried. I mean, <laughs> this is sort of a combination of a tricorder and a communicator. You had another invention that we worked on, which was a way to visualize in three dimensions uh, topography. Oh, yeah. That never really became commercially important, but you could like lay out a map on a table. And then if the map showed hills and things like that, you'd push a button and the hills, the map would actually stretch. It was made on rubber and it would stretch and the hills would rise up and it was a kind of programmable surface. Oh, so it was the table would have like pinpoints that would go up based yeah. on how far the cool. Yeah, that's right. It was very dramatic. It got it got gasped from people, but it was not something that uh, was ever a mass thing because it was kind of expensive and it was all mechanical and so on. Seems like a movie prop. Yeah, it would probably make a good movie prop. I mean, I'm sure somebody will figure out a way of doing it cheaper with holograms or something eventually, but but it it is kind of a wow. One of the applications was visualization for battlefields. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. You know, I would say that that's in the category of that was a, a great demo, but it never really found a real solid business application. But as opposed to Pinch to Zoom, which, you know, was such a good idea that it just became so ubiquitous, people can't even imagine it as an invention. I mean, kind of like the parallel processing stuff is also in that category. Similar to the parallel processing, what was it back then before there was multi-touch that made you think, yeah, we should have multi-touch. This is crazy. Why don't we? You know, I, that was very much just a personal urge. Like, that's what I wanted to do with it. I love maps, and I always wanted to just, you know, zoom in on a map like that. And, and it's very, maybe the equivalent would be what I just told you. Like, I, I would love to see a map of my ignorance. I have a personal urge for that. So that's that's part of what drives me to work on the underlay. So some of it is you just want something to exist. So I remember changing the topic here. I, I saw a TED Talk you did on, on your cancer research. And maybe you could tell us what got you interested in that. That actually, it was a it was a doctor, an oncologist by the name of David Agus, who actually came to me for that. And he said, look, I have a problem, which is right now we classify cancer by what part of the body it appeared on. And that has almost nothing to do with how to treat it. So just because something appeared in the lung doesn't mean that it's going to respond to a particular chemotherapy or something like that. And on the other hand, the same thing that does respond to a particular 
drug may appear in all kinds of parts of the body. So it's kind of the wrong classification system. And to really understand what's going on, I need to see the pathways that the cell is expressing. And there's no instrument to measure that. I would need to know the proteins that were being expressed by this cancer. And that's not something we know how to measure. We do know how to measure the DNA, but we don't know how to measure the proteins. And so I started thinking about that, and I'd done some work in building mass spectrometers before, and that's a known method of doing it. And I I kind of looked at why that wasn't working, what the problems with that were. Uh, And and so I teamed up with a really interesting team of people, like a guy by the name of John Bloom and Dan Ruderman, and we worked out a way of, in principle, measuring proteins, and then we spent years and years getting it to work. And finally got to the point where we could measure the proteins in a drop of blood. And here's the amazing thing. There's more proteins in a drop of blood than there are human proteins. Now, how could that be? Well, the answer is because you're also seeing all the proteins produced by your gut bacteria and produced by chemical changes in the proteins and so on. So so we can see literally hundreds of thousands of different protein variants in a drop of blood and get a quantitative measurement on it. So I think that's going to become a very important area. Right now, everybody is very distracted by genetics, which is, it's it's amazing the things you can do in genetics, and genetics is much easier. But over the long run, I think proteomics is going to be more important for health, because mostly sick people used to be healthy people, and they still have the same genes. So it's not really genes are the difference between being sick and healthy. It's something that's going on kind of in the runtime state of your body, which is the proteins. And how are you detecting them? So that one is really not a new invention. That one's much more just engineering. So the basic invention people invented a long time ago, which is you use a mass spectrometer and you use some kind of chromatography to to split it along one dimension and you use a mass spectrometer to split it by a different dimension. But there's a whole lot of engineering to getting it so that when you put in a drop of blood and it does exactly the same thing every time. And there's just a million ways that it can vary and change. And so it's just kind of nailing those things down one at a time. So I was figuring out what the sources of variation were. It's a little bit in the spirit of building a semiconductor line. I mean, in principle, there's no difference between a lab bench and a semiconductor line. It's just the semiconductor line works a lot better in its scale. So the interesting part here isn't necessarily how you're detecting these proteins. It's knowing which proteins are there and what that is expressing. And that's more bioinformatics, right? Yeah. And so, well, actually, just measuring them is really interesting. But it's an engineering problem more than a, you know, a new invention of how to do it. And then once you've measured them, then that puts you in the position of asking, well, what does it mean that I've got that pattern of proteins? And so that's kind of where we are now. We're just beginning to be able to ask those questions because we just now have the measurements. And are you using machine learning models to decide this? Yes. Yeah. But it would be actually much more useful if we had the underlay and we could read all that information that was in papers because you know there are millions of papers about proteins and what they do and what expresses them. They're just not in any form that we can digest it. So right now, the only way of getting it out of a paper is through a scientist's head, and scientists can only read so many papers. So with, with this system, you could look at proteins and, and analyze the proteins that are present and develop a profile proteins that might indicate a cancer, for example? Well, might indicate it, but more important, it's not so much just detecting it, but it might indicate that the cancer was susceptible to a certain kind of treatment. So right now, let's say there's 10 different kinds of of lung cancer, which there are at least 10 different kinds of lung cancer. And you have a drug that only works on one of them. Well, that's not a useful drug. You can't get that through the FDA because it doesn't have enough effective response rate. It only works on 10% of the people. It probably might hurt 5% of the people. But if you can categorize it. Exactly. If you can categorize it and say, these are the people it's going to help. And we know it's not going to hurt these people because, you know, those are the people that hurt. So we won't give it to those people and we will give it to the ones that will help. Well, it's a miracle drug for those people. But right now we don't know who those people are. 
Yeah, and, and this is the problem you're speaking of. That classifying a cancer as a lung cancer is silly because that it is in the lungs is pointless. It's the type of cancer that matters. And if you have a drug for that type, then that is what matters. Yeah, but strangely enough, even though this is obvious and any doctor knows all the facts behind it, it's still true that their medical billing code is lung cancer. And when you do a treatment, you do a clinical study, you do a clinical study to get a drug approved for lung cancer. So, you know, that is, is something that sort of makes sense for infectious diseases, but it doesn't make sense for these kind of systemic diseases like cancer or neurodegenerative diseases. You know, we need a different way of, of classifying diseases. So it's going to take a while for the for medicine to take advantage of this because it's such a different way of thinking about things and paying for things, which also gets in the way of things. <laughs> and this would be a more data-intensive approach to medicine as well. Yeah. And this also goes back to relating to the underlay because a lot of the information that you need to understand that data is locked up in all of these papers all over the place. And so we're going to need machines to help us comprehend all of that knowledge to apply this new information effectively. Let me ask you a philosophical question. You've worked in so many different areas. You've accomplished so much. What ties it all together? What led you to go from one thing to the next? How do you, how do you pick your projects? Well, I would say that I'm curious. <laughs> um, and so I am always kind of looking for those edges of knowledge. But I think I was very lucky that early on that you know, my parallel processing exposed me to a lot of different fields. And so I was aware of maybe a broader set of things than people who had specialized because so many people were using my computers for everything from finding oil to looking for marketing data and credit cards that I got exposed to a lot of different things. And a lot of the interesting things are not at the center of the of fields, but they are on the edges of fields or in between fields. They're in those gaps. And so that's what I've always been interested in is kind of exploring those holes. So it's almost like ties in with the map of one's ignorance. (laughs) It does kind of, that's right. That's such a compelling metaphor for me because I think that's sort of what I do. It's like, what do I not understand? And, And there's obviously so much of it. And fortunately, I'm, I'm very lucky to, you know, be in a community, you know, I hang out a lot at MIT, for example, and, you know, I'm constantly running into new people who are telling me about the problems that they're working on. Or the other thing that I learn a lot from, and and I've sort of constructed my company to be people come to me with problems. And the people that come to me, they don't just come to me with the problem, but they also know something. So they know a lot about mining or agriculture or something like that. And they have to teach me about their problem before I can understand their problem. So I get a lot of very smart people teaching me things, which is a, why I like my job. So there's the people who are not experts in things, but from outside of the area of expertise can give a fresh look and a fresh perspective and often are the best problem solvers. It sounds like that's what, what the case is with you. I think that that's certainly the way that I solve problems. I think that I mean, certainly there's some problems that are better solved by somebody who is a drill deep specialist. And if there is a specialist in solving your problem, then you probably do better to go to them because <laughs> they've made a lifetime of studying that. But I tend to look at problems that there isn't a specialist in solving. So I'm kind of the last resort of what do you do if there's not somebody who knows how to solve that problem? Maybe the bigger problems or the, or the out-of-the-box problems. I think both kinds of problems exist. Both both are very important. And I guess my unique contribution is the more interdisciplinary, out-of-the-box-ish problems. I mean, I think that's where I have something to offer. Because I don't have that single area that I've devoted my life to that I have the depth in. So you, you mentioned that you've worked with some great intellects during your career. And I know for example, you worked with Marvin Minsky. I think you studied under Marvin Minsky. Yep. Uh, Richard Feynman was active with you in, in thinking machines. Do you, do you have you observed that there's a trait that these that these great minds have in common? Or, or yeah, I, I would add Claude Shannon to that list as another one. Um, yeah, actually, well, first of all, it's no coincidence. I think that they all I mean I learned from them this idea of 
looking around the edges of things and always being curious. But yeah, I think they're all curious. They were all playful. They all loved being proved wrong. And they also all were very comfortable being in a situation that they didn't understand. They liked that feeling of confusion and ambiguity where they're trying to figure something out. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable. In many situations, you're trained to be in control and you're trained if you're confused, something's wrong. But actually, this kind of exploratory thing, you have to be willing to embrace that state of confusion and ignorance and be able to say, well, you know, what is it I don't understand about this? Why is this, you know, why is this not making sense to me? And, and so I think I learned that from them, that they were all willing to do that. Is that different from curiosity or is it a, a separate branch of the same sort of idea? I think curiosity is a, is a good word for it, but I think it's maybe it's a kind of a follow through on curiosity because a lot of people might be curious about something. But it's one thing to sort of wonder, oh, gee, I wonder what's inside that cave. And that's a completely different thing to crawl inside the cave and expose yourself to the fear of the unknown and being in that environment. And so I think it's, it's sort of curiosity with follow through. Let me ask you about the pattern in the stone. I was very honored you gave me a copy of, of the book for my son when we visited you one time. And it's a, it's it, it makes it so easy to understand a very complicated topic, which is that the organization of computers. Given all the developments since you wrote the book in 1998, would you would you do anything different? Would you just add <laughs> new stuff to it, or what would you what would you say? <laughs> Actually, it's very funny. It's not a hypothetical question because I got a I got a very backhanded compliment from my publisher that book recently, which was they said, you know, that's the only computer book and from from the last century that we have that's still selling. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, so I, I actually went back over it to see, they said, would you like to revise it? And I did write a little introduction for it, but I actually, there really wasn't, there was almost nothing in it that was wrong. If I was writing it today, I'd talk more about the internet. You know, there are things I would talk more about, but the things that it talked about, for instance, there was a chapter on quantum computing that there's not a lot more to say about it now, interestingly enough. But because what I did is I wrote that book about the ideas behind computing rather than the technology of computing, the technology is almost never mentioned at all. So the fact that computers are a million times faster than they were when I wrote that book doesn't matter. All the ideas are kind of the same. So it's interesting to me how much the ideas have changed the same. So I'm, I'm actually surprised at how little I would revise. But so most of the ideas were, were there in the last century. What's changed is the technology for implementing them and the scale on which they're implemented and so on. But the actual ideas about how it all works haven't changed all that much. And some probably were enhanced, like uh, parallelism is something that's just been growing. It, it... <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of interesting, and it's sort of grown in two ways. One is we actually sort of made two machines. We, the first machine we made was a single instruction multiple data machine, which has sort of become the the graphics coprocessor inside your laptop. And then the other thing we made was a multiple instruction multiple data, which has sort of become the cloud. And so both of those things have have really, I mean, I would have thought one of would have, one out and one didn't but in fact they both had their purposes and they both you know they're both a million times faster than they were when we did it of course but the ideas are basically this you know basically there so one of the things that's interesting about computers is is it is kind of interesting how little even though the technology has changed a lot the fundamental ideas haven't changed that much as opposed to say biology where the ideas have actually changed quite a lot in that period of time and so i would say that if you look where the sort of the next explosion of stuff is going to come it's probably going to come more from biology so biology is now more in the state that computers were in when i was working on parallel processing so you're telling me if i want to have a book that lasts for 30 years not to write it in biology uh yeah i think they, they would get out of date pretty fast in biology i think that's right so I think of the 
you know, the genetic code is kind of an interesting toolkit. You know, just like programmers write programs and computers have a certain structure. Isn't the genetic code kind of like a programming system, really? Yes and no. Actually, a pro- it's more like a programming system than it's usually described. It's usually, just, but it's a sort of a mer- it's a very funny programming language. So, I remember before we had the ability to manipulate genes, people used to say, "Oh, well, we'll it'll be very easy to find what each gene is for because we'll just go and we'll knock it out. So we'll we'll remove this gene and we'll see what breaks." And the big surprise was we actually got the technology and we could go and we could take a mouse and take a gene out of it and see what broke. And the answer is almost always nothing broke. So it was sort of hard to say what the gene was for because it seemed to work perfectly well without it. Because the biological system is so adaptive and redundant and so on that it has lots of ways of making things work. And so the mapping between the sort of causes and effects is not nearly as neat as it is in a computer program where somebody put that line of code there for a reason. In biology, a gene is there for a kind of emergent reason, which is really many reasons, which doesn't map necessarily to our little stories of cause and effect very neatly. So that's why it's going to be rewriting the biology book every year for for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's why we probably will need actual machines to help us understand this in a way that we don't need for... I mean, a computer is very complicated, but it's designed by a human. So at some level, a human understood it. Now, that's less true now than it was when I was designing computers. I mean, when I was designing the connection machine, you know, I literally drew the transistors on the chip. And so I kind of understood it from the shape of the transistors on the chip all the way up to the, you know, the operating system and the compilers and everything like that. These days, so many, you know, that's a much bigger job done by many more people. And I don't think anybody understands a computer in that sense anymore, because there's just too many pieces of it that were designed by different people. So, In some sense, technology is becoming a bit more like biology, that it's a kind of emergent thing. And biology is becoming more like technology. So I think we're going to have a a period that the distinction between what's natural and what's artificial is going to get all tangled up. So I think we're we're leaving the age of the Enlightenment and we're entering the age of the entanglement. (laughs) (laughs) One last question. What what are you working on now? I mean, you mentioned the underlay. Is is that what's occupying you most, or I have two big projects. Um, of course, I'm finishing the clock, but <laughs> but the two big projects. One the, is the not for profit project is the underlay, and then I'm also at at applied invention. I'm very interested. I mean, besides my customers' projects, which I can't talk about, but my own project is. I'm very interested in security on the on the internet, and I think it really needs to be rethought at a very fundamental level. Otherwise, I think we're setting ourselves up for disaster. Right now, I think we have a system that is was basically designed for good guys to use to talk to each other, and it's been patched up in ways to keep the bad guys out, but it was never designed in the first place to be used for what it's being used for now and to be dependent on in the ways that we're depending on it now. So I I think that needs to be kind of rethought from first principles. So I'm working with a group of people at Applied Invention to do that, and I think we're having some success. That's that's very interesting. So, yeah, I guess if if you think about the Internet, it came out of DARPA and, you know, and different universities and the government cooperating, and they were all researchers at the time. And they weren't worried about malefactors when they designed it. Yeah, and and the fact is, you know, most people didn't care what they were doing, and so they were building it for their friends. They were building it to talk to their friends. So it was it was a network of good guys in a sense, and that was the way they thought it. Now they were a bunch of hippies, and they didn't trust the phone companies, but they did trust the systems administrators, and they trusted the users of the network. But now the users are the ones that are going to get you. Yeah, or or even, you know, the service providers might be bad. And the equipment can be compromised. And, the, you know, there's lots of, but that's right. 
It's the users, it's the people that are on the network that you have to worry about. And so it's a very different set of assumptions that was designed. And remember, they were just trying to get people to adopt it. So one of the things they did is they optimized it for ease of adoption, which was a really smart idea at the time and you know, was incredibly successful. But the, some of the things they did to make it easy to adopt also worked against the security. So you know, I would like to think that if you took that same quality of thinking that went into it, but with the understanding of how people are actually using it and what the problems are, but did that same kind of foundational thinking about it, you'd come up with something very different. So so just like you reorganized search through MetaWeb, we're going to have security is going to have a, a, a paradigm shift. I think so. I think definitely network security is just going to be rethought completely. And what we have now is a system of, of sort of patches and fingers in the dike that, you know, it's kind of heroic, but... It's. I think it's doomed to failure. Well, it's like the virus software. It's as soon as somebody is successful at, at screwing things up, they they put a patch in, so they can somebody can be incented to uh, come up with a better virus. It's like an arms race. Yeah, it's a, it's an arms race, and the defenders are not inherently at the advantage. And so, but I think you could just you could design a system where the defenders had a, were inherently in a stronger position. And so that's that's what I'm working on right now. Well, we're looking forward to seeing that. Um, I did want to ask you, when we were talking about Longtail, you mentioned you found a mountain. I know at one time you were looking in California. Uh, is, do I understand that the mountain is now in Texas? Uh, yeah. Actually, we ended up with two mountains. <laughs> we have one in Nevada, which we bought. And then we realized and it's sitting in the middle of a national park. And we realized... It was going to take us a long time to get the National Park to give us permission to walk through the National Park to build the clock. So, and we couldn't afford to have helicopters fly into our mountain. So this mountain is actually right near the Texas-New Mexico border. And it's fortunate that the land around it is Jeff Bezos' land. So (laughs) that solves the problem of access. (laughs) Danny, any other comments or Colin, any other questions? No, I was other than, you know, you and I have worked on a pretty wide range of things over the years. It's fun to get a chance to talk about them. I, I remember it used to be so much fun to go down for the for the Christmas parties uh, in the early days with implied inventions. Well, uh, when the, the epidemic's over, we'll start them up again. Well, I'll, I'll come up and visit you or if you're in Texas to visit your brother, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be fun, and we've and, and actually we've got some pretty cool offices in Cambridge too, so that's a, that's that's worth the visit too. Definitely, definitely. Colin, anything else to add? No, I just the the takeaway I get from this is to not only stay curious but just to follow through. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I, uh, that's a that's a that's a great one. I I wish I was better at it. I wish I could follow through at everything. Yeah, just just I got a curiosity, pun intended. Um, you get curious about something and you're already working on something else. How do you manage to to keep focused? Because that always seems like it would be an issue. Okay, so my secret thing is that I surround myself with people who are much smarter and more focused than I am. And so, you know, I've, I've const- I always have you know, teams of people who really do get focused on a project. And that's, that's really what's made me successful has always been the people – around me who each push you forward and get you to keep going basically creativity is very much a team process you know it's a community that has ideas and implements ideas and so on i mean we like the myth of the lone inventor but it doesn't really work that way it's really a community of people and you know part is the people in my company who work on the project but part of it is the extended community of you know, the people I talk to at MIT, the people in the companies that I work with that are understanding things about the problem. And so I'm just very lucky to be part of a very rich community of creative, knowledgeable people. Danny, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And I'm so grateful that, that you, you're available to, to meet with us today. Well, it's a pleasure talking. This concludes this episode of the Perpetual Motion Podcast. Copyright Perkins Coie 2020. Thank you for listening. Thank mm-hmm. you.